Happy Palm Sunday, everyone. This is Pastor Irwin. I want to welcome you to Mosaic. What a great day to be alive and to be reminded of the extraordinary gift that God has given us in His Son, Jesus. You know, one of the curious things about Palm Sunday is that the, the, the whole dynamic of Palm Sunday is about triumph. It's about conquest. It's about celebration. It's about festival. And, and it almost feels as if Palm Sunday should come after Easter, not before Good Friday. Even the way that John describes it, what you have is this intersection of, of the Passover celebration. And they really had no idea that, that God had established in history this moment of celebration that would be layered over the sacrifice of Jesus. They were celebrating a victory that they did not understand was about to take place. In John chapter 12, beginning in verse 12, John tells us this. He says, the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified, did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him? Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now, when we start at the beginning here in verse 12, we see that there's, this is the context of festival and celebration. People are, were already on the streets celebrating what God had done generations before. God had delivered his people, Israel, out of the captivity of the Egyptians. And there's this reminder of God's faithfulness and of God's promise to deliver them and give them a future and to give them freedom. And this was overlaid with the coming of Jesus in this moment. When uh, I had the opportunity to go down to Rio de Janeiro, uh, to Brazil, to experience the World Cup, to be there for the finals of, uh, of Argentina versus Germany. And I, I remember that night before, uh, that Saturday night when people were celebrating everywhere on the streets. Now, normally at two, three, four in the morning in Rio de Janeiro, you're not encouraged to go outside and walk the streets. But I'm telling you, that night, the streets were filled with festival and, and singing and laughter and celebration. And, and there'd just be hundreds and hundreds of, of German fans singing German fight songs and celebrating their team. And then there'd be hundreds and hundreds of Argentines walking the streets and dancing and singing and celebrating the Argentine team. And, and it was this incredibly exhilarating experience. And, and I, I, I wasn't German or Argentine, but I was just enjoying the night. And the next day was the World Cup Finals. Both teams were celebrating a victory they expected, they hoped would come. Now, I can tell you the next day, the streets were quiet as far as it came to Argentines. Because when Germany won the victory, there was only one mass community celebrating their victory. See, Palm Sunday is that day before the day. It's the celebration before the victory. And the people were lining the streets, celebrating a victory that had been won generations before, but they didn't know that there was a greater celebration taking place, that there was another victory that was about to take place, a victory that would overshadow every victory they had ever known or ever experienced. Jesus was about to fight the ultimate battle. But Palm Sunday was the celebration before the engagement. It was the declaration of victory before the declaration of war. And I do think it's, it's fascinating that, that when Jesus came to Jerusalem, the people began shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Look with me in verse 13. As the people declare 
their allegiance, their belief that Jesus was the promise from God to them of deliverance and freedom. And what to me is so amazing is that they were declaring something they did not understand. But there is something powerfully compelling about who Jesus is. And this is one of the things that I think Palm Sunday reminds us of, is that there's a compelling nature to who Jesus is or the promise of Jesus or the possibility of Jesus, the, the possibility that God would enter into human history, that God would choose to take on flesh and blood, that God would actually want us more than we wanted him, that God would be willing to pay a price for us that we would not be willing to pay for ourselves. I mean, this this promise that God would crash into time and space and allow himself to be crucified so that we might have forgiveness and freedom, it's so incredulous and unbelievable that there is no one in the world who could have ever known what they were celebrating. And so they cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. They, they, they understood that there was a promise of a Messiah, a Christ, a deliverer, a savior of the world. They understood that humanity, or at least Israel, desperately needed for God to act on their behalf. They could not have understood the full implications or ramifications of what Jesus coming to the world actually meant. But even before I came to believe in Jesus, before I, I came to entrust my life to him, there was something so compelling about Jesus. And, and even now you may be listening and, and you still are not sure about God or you still are not sure about Jesus, but there's something compelling about the possibility of God coming into history for you. I mean, think about this. There's just something so compelling about the promise that God loves you without condition, that, that God is fighting for you. Even when you're not willing to fight for yourself. Palm Sunday is a, a window into what we were created to be and to do. We were created to live in the celebration of life. We were created to live in the celebration of God. We were created to live in this relationship with the God who made us and knows us and loves us. And, and I can tell you that, that when you begin to see Jesus for who he is, even just a glimpse of understanding of who Jesus is, he will become compelling to you. But then at the same time that Jesus compels us. He also confounds us. See, they, they, they were celebrating the coming of the king, but then it says Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. And, and this just is counterintuitive. It doesn't match the brand. For Jesus to be the king, to be the Messiah, to be the savior of the world, it doesn't match the brand to come in on a young donkey. It, it, it seems as if he should come in on a white horse. It seems as if he should come with, with, with a battalion of angels at his side. And yet Jesus comes in with such humility and simplicity, comes riding on a young donkey. It doesn't match the narrative of the celebration of the victory that's being promised. And John reminds us that it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. This is John talking about himself and talking about his peers. He's talking about the, 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 the friends that he has walked with all these years. And he's saying, I, I didn't get it. This is John saying, look, none of us understood. None of us could, could make sense of this. And, and, and so we knew in this moment of celebration that, that Jesus was the, the, the king and the Messiah, that he was the promise that we should celebrate, that Hosanna is what we should be declaring to him. But at the same time, it was a little confusing because he came in on a donkey and it, it didn't seem to, 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 to verify or validate his authority and his position, his title. And the one thing about Jesus that will always be true is the same way that he will compel you to himself. And there'll be something in your soul that says, I, I know I need God. And, 
And, and if there is a God, it makes sense that, that God would be a God of love and that God would sacrifice himself for us. If there is a God, it makes sense that he would fight for me. And he'll compel you, but he'll also confound you because he's not the kind of God that you would think he would be. Because I think, I think most of the time we, we want a, a God who is more a reflection of our deepest longings. We want the power to live the life we want to live. We, we want to have the, the force of, uh, of nature behind us so that we can exert our will in the world. We do not want a God who humbles himself. We do not want a God who chooses to serve. I mean, we, don't, we do not want a God who thinks sacrifice is the highest virtue and value and that we should follow his example. And so the disciples did not understand all this because they didn't understand who God was. Now, these are the people who have had the scriptures for generations. These are the people where Moses brought the Ten Commandments and gave them the precepts for how to form a nation. These are the very people that the guy would send the prophets to speak into their lives and the people that he gave the promise of the Messiah, of the Christ, and they could not understand all this. No matter how hard God tried to communicate, and, and what's interesting is that John is saying, this is just as it was written. See, this isn't a, 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 a just unexpected left turn. This isn't God just, just coming out of nowhere. What John is saying, no, this was written. This is the way God always told us it was going to happen, and we just couldn't hear it because we didn't want to believe that God was this simple, this humble, that God would choose a donkey rather than a stallion. It's only after Jesus was glorified that they realized that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. And so what's interesting to me in this moment is that what confounded them was not that God did something different than what he wrote. It's not that God did something different than what he told them he would do. It's not that God did something different than what he promised. It's that he did exactly what he had written, exactly what he had spoken, exactly what he had promised. They just didn't believe he could really have meant what he said. For all of Israel's history, from every time they had built an altar, from every time they had sacrificed a lamb, every time there was, there was blood on that altar, it was a foreshadowing that God would become the lamb that would take away the sins of the world. See, all those sacrifices were not necessary. They were preparing the human heart for what was essential. God was trying to tell them a story through metaphor and ritual. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you my son and he will become the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And yet even when he came, even when he was walking toward Jerusalem and they were celebrating him and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They could not see that just on the other side of the celebration was the crucifixion. I think this is one of the great challenges we have when it comes to trusting Jesus with our lives. Is that I, I, I think that we would turn to God as long as God was more of an indifferent universe that would promise us his power and his goodwill. It's, it's much more terrifying when you realize, oh no, I'm being asked to entrust my life to God who will call me to a life of sacrifice and servanthood. A God who would, will call me to live my most heroic life as well. It goes on to tell us that as Jesus came in on the donkey, and his disciples were trying to make sense of it. And it was only as, as, as all these things came together, they finally understood. It tells us in verse 17, now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. So the crowd 
that had been with Jesus when Jesus spoke and called Lazarus out of the dead. They're the ones that kept following him, and they're the ones that kept spreading the word of what was going on. It says, many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. And so they heard that Jesus raised the dead. Well, that's massive motivation to see what else might happen. It says, many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, this is so interesting to me, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And so what's fascinating to me is that, is that John is telling us there's this massive crowd gathering around and there's, there, there, those are, uh, there are those who are just shouting and, and their praises to Jesus and declaring him their Messiah. But then you have the Pharisees who also knew about the resurrection of, or the, uh, of Lazarus. They knew that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and they, in turn, were not motivated to worship Jesus or to follow him or to even consider him. They were terrified that the whole world would choose him and follow him. See, there's an extraordinary thing about what happens when you press toward these days called the Passion. When you press through Palm Sunday to Good Friday to Easter Sunday. Jesus becomes more than just someone who compels you to to consider the possibility of God, that you're created for a relationship with God, that you need him. And and it's even more than being confounded by God because it's hard to make sense of why God does what he does in the world, in our lives. And But also what you find is that, that Jesus also reveals us that there's this, this, there's this unexplainable dynamic and yet undeniable that how you respond to Jesus will tell you more about yourself than it does even Jesus. The Pharisees became angry and their concern is this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. I mean, just pause for a moment and, and think about what the implications would be if the whole world had gone after him. I mean, there, there, there's these great projects all around that I, I see in, in our community happening through Los Angeles, happening through Mosaic, uh, happening in other countries in the world. I, I mean, if someone came and said, we're going to make sure every single child in, in Los Angeles, no matter how rich or poor, that every child has a laptop, every child has an iPad. We're going to make sure that every child has a great school with great teachers to be educated. We would all be for that. Oh, let's make sure that goes to everyone. I mean, if we say, look, we're going to make sure that, that every single person has, has, has a home or has a warm meal. We go, this is amazing. And, and we want to make sure we're committed that every person on this planet would live a life of freedom. Everyone would have, would have health care. We'd go, oh, that, that, that sounds amazing. Now, what are the implications of this statement? Look how the whole world has gone after him. What would have happened if the whole world had gone after Jesus? See, what would have happened if everyone had decided, I'm going to leave behind hate and choose love. I'm going to leave behind bitterness and choose forgiveness. I'm going to leave behind greed and choose generosity. I'm going to leave behind a life of self-indulgence and selfishness and choose a life of, of selflessness and sacrifice. What, what, what would the world look like if the whole world had gone after him? A world filled with love. A world filled with hope. A world filled with faith. See, if the whole world had gone after him, there would be no more war. There would be no more poverty. There would be no more injustice. Oh, if only they had been right. If only the whole world had gone after him. In John chapter 12, just before this passage, verses 9 and 10, he tells us this. He says, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found that Jesus 
was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. There were those who actually saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. And instead of repenting of their sin and turning to God, they decided to not only kill Jesus, but to kill Lazarus as well. Kill the evidence. Kill the proof. I think sometimes we convince ourselves that, well, I would believe in God if I could just see a miracle. I would believe in God if I could see someone raised from the dead. I, I, I would believe in God if, if, if God would heal me of this sickness or if God would give me this job or if God would, you know, give me this career. And, and we, we're always just throwing things out there saying, I would believe in God if. And the reality is that this moment reminds us that's not true. They saw Jesus raise a man from the dead. And instead of having their hearts broken and posturing their hearts toward Jesus, their hearts were hardened and they were determined to kill Jesus and any proof that he was the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world. See, if, if you do not want the freedom that Jesus brings, there's nothing Jesus could do to convince you. Because God will not force his love on you. He will not force himself on us. God will love us and fight for us. He will reveal himself and declare his intent toward us. But God leaves it to us to choose what we will do with Jesus. It was Palm Sunday and they were celebrating a victory that they did not even know would come. They couldn't imagine that Jesus would be crucified, but they really could not imagine that he would be resurrected from the dead. They were celebrating a victory that had not yet happened. It was just a short time ago when we had the Super Bowl, and, and it was a fascinating Super Bowl to watch in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of quarantine. One, I, I think for me, it was just great to get to watch sports. And and it was the, the Kansas City Chiefs against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, for those of you that do not really follow sports. And and it was, a, a, in, in many ways, an iconic Super Bowl because you, you had the Chiefs who won the Super Bowl the year before and they were considered the powerhouse of the National Football League. They, and, and, and Patrick Mahomes is considered the, almost like the, the new breed of quarterback, the, uh, the greatest quarterback in this moment in history and the future of football. And then you had the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers that, that really have developed more of a culture of losing for quite a long time. And they were able to, to get Tom Brady to come to be their quarterback. And even though Tom Brady has won six Super Bowls up to that time, you think, well, Tom Brady, he's sort of like a vintage quarterback. He, 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 he's, he's last year's model. He's the best quarterback that there was up to Patrick Mahomes. And, and it didn't really seem as if the story was going to end very well for Tom Brady going against this powerhouse team with this extraordinarily talented, gifted quarterback in Mahomes. And yet here he was having already taken his team to defeat the Saints with Drew Brees and taken his team to defeat the, the Packers with, with Aaron Rodgers. And so here Brady is one by one defeating all the greatest quarterbacks alive today. And the week before the Super Bowl, every night at 11 p.m., he was sent a text to his teammates that simply said, we are going to win this game. We are going to win this game. We are going to win this game. Now, Tom Brady knew what it took to win. There's a mindset where you have to win the battle before you enter the battle. 
And I'm so convinced he, he knew that his teammates, as talented and gifted and extraordinary as they were, did not have a championship mindset. And he was having to construct within them a Palm Sunday before they entered into their Good Friday so that they could experience their Resurrection Sunday. Tom Brady sending that little text, we will win this game, and creating this echo chamber inside of every one of their souls, we will win this game. I, I'm convinced the Bucks won the game before they ever walked on the field. Palm Sunday is Jesus sending us a message. We will win this game. This battle has already been won. This war is finished. They didn't even know what they were celebrating, but it should have been the greatest celebration the world has ever seen because they're about to step into the greatest battle that had ever been fought because on the cross, Jesus fought the battle for every human being. He fought the battle for you and for me. You're about to step into the greatest victory that could ever be known. Because on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. So today, this Palm Sunday, let's celebrate the victories that have already been won. Let's enter every battle in our life. And I don't know what you're facing right now. Maybe you've lost your job or Maybe your life feels as if it's in disarray. Maybe you've lost your dreams. You may have lost your company, your business during this year of, of quarantine and, and shutdown. You may feel as if you're so defeated and you're overwhelmed and you're crushed. And you wonder if there's any future for you. I want you to know that Jesus has already won the victory before you ever entered the battle. You just need to hear him speak to you and tell you this battle has already been won. You have already won. You can dance in the streets before you go in to the game because the outcome has already been determined. Palm Sunday is the celebration of the victories yet experienced through the resurrection of Jesus. If you're listening to me right now and you've never trusted Jesus with your life, if you've never crossed the line of faith, I want you right now in this moment to make a life-changing decision. This decision will change your destiny. If you will give your life to Jesus, Jesus will forgive you of all your sin. He will set you free. He will guide you into your future and you can celebrate even before the victory. If you're listening to me right now in this moment and you know you need God, you know you need Jesus, you finally get it. God stepped into human history. He took on flesh and blood. His name is Jesus. He died on a cross for me. He rose from the dead so that I could live. If it finally has come together for you and you're ready to give your life to Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, I give you my life. Right now, just tell him, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. It's not everything you and God need to talk about. There will there'll be so many conversations to come. But this is where it begins. Because what they didn't know they were celebrating on that Palm Sunday was that God would give his life for them so that each of them can have an intimate relationship with the God who created them. If you just prayed with me, Jesus, I give you my life. I want you to know that you've just crossed the line of faith and that you now belong to God, that Jesus dwells within you and that God will never leave you or forsake you, that this is the beginning of your future. This is the beginning of life.